it, it took it took me a minute, but I did it. <laughs> it was it wasn't with somebody Ooh. like you either. So it was like, okay, so I will have done all the normal stuff. Okay, guys. So today is the first in the week that we've talked about that we have been talking about. You so you heard my solo finale before this. The, today is the day that where we start the first half of the season where we are taking a deep dive into forgiveness, what that means, and how each of us processes that differently. As I've said many times, and I'm going to say again, we use the Enneagram as a neutral tool to help us understand ourselves and how God made us each. Because I always say when he made us, he says, I didn't make one quite like this. And so <laughs> as we uh, dive into how God made us. This book, uh, this this entire series uh, of these first nine episodes is loosely based on a book by Jeff and Beth McCord, who I had the opportunity to interview. And you can pop back to the um, to the the episode before the season premiere to hear their interview. Their book, More Than a Number, out September twentieth, and likely already out by the time this airs. And so with that being said, I would love to welcome to the Wednesdays with Watson podcast for the second time, my friend, Amber Colin. Thank you so much, Amber, for being here today. You're welcome. It's good to be with you, Amy. If I remember last time we we tried to do, well, we did and we published it. We were having so many technical issues. I actually <laughs> ended up talking to you on the phone and holding it up to my to my microphone. Yes, that was so crazy. So, <laughs> but it worked. It worked. But it, but it worked. And, you know, I don't hate it when I go back and listen to it. That's well, right. I am so excited. You are the first episode, though, not the first one that I have recorded in this series on uh, the Enneagram and how each of us navigate this road of forgiveness. And so in some ways, Amber, you're going to kind of, you're going to kind of get what listeners are getting as we set up the series. And as I mentioned on almost every episode, Jesus continues to remain the star of all of our stories, but the core scripture that we are using for this series is Ephesians 432. And it is not a suggestion to us guys. This is a commandment. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, compassionate, forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. And Amber, as I was building the the season and writing and thinking and praying um, on my fabulous, remarkable, hey, maybe they'll sponsor us. Go remarkable. That's right. Um, I have mine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, as I was, as I was writing it out, I remembered a verse and it's in all four gospels where Jesus says, if you don't forgive, I won't forgive you. Mm-hmm. And that is maybe to me, one of the scariest verses in the Bible. You know what I'm saying? Like, I do. That just makes you think like, okay. And so I dug a little bit deeper into that. And this is just me being me. And before we got on, you and I were having a friendship conversation about how scientific my brain is, but I can't help but wonder if the ability to forgive is in fact a fruit of receiving the Holy Spirit um, and, and and being forgiven. And so when Jesus said that to 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 the, to the disciples and to the people of whom he was speaking, perhaps he was saying, if you don't believe in me and that I am the, the way, the truth and the life, and ultimately would be the sacrifice where they would see his, he himself say, Father, forgive me, forgive them for they don't know what they do. I think what he was saying is if you don't believe that, that I died for you, then, then, mm-hmm. then I can't forgive you. And that's just me being, that's kind of a Watsonism, but we are absolutely basing this whole series, this whole season really on, on Ephesians 432, but you do come to us as our type one Enneagram. Uh, and, and it's so funny because I love you so much because I, I love guys follow her on social media. First of all, you're, you're just hilarious, but uh, so type, <laughs> so type ones, uh, and I'm going to, we'll, we'll go, we'll go and I'm, I'll head in a, in a place. I promise guys, but type ones have often been said they will, they will find the mistake in your status on, 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 on anything. Right. And so if you follow, if you follow Amber, the uh, grace enough podcast, you will not find errors, but you will find lots of hilarious things. But well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> oh my word, girl. I get really mad at myself when there are errors. <laughs> oh, I, I don't think I've ever seen an error uh, oh. from you, but um, we love our type ones. You know, they say that uh, as the, and by they, I mean, they, uh, the, the people that study these things says that the Enneagram type one has the loudest inner critic 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and I've heard you talk about on your own shows, I, 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 um, I'm a faithful listener of the, of the Grace Enough podcast, but I went back a few shows and I've, I've heard you often talk about this, this inner critic of, of the one. Does that resonate with you a little bit? Oh yeah. I mean, I remember when I first started learning about the Enneagram and realized that I was a one, that was what, that was probably the first part that was really stuck out or stood out to me. It was this strong inner critic that like never shuts up. And, you know, I've only recently come to realize that everybody has a little bit of that, but when I realized there was a large part of the population that was similar to me in that way, I thought, okay, like this is maybe not healthy, but it is somewhat normal. Um, and so I just, I remember, I can't remember what I was listening to, but I kind of gave that inner critic a name. And so, you know, now some of my closest friends will be like, you need to tell Irene to pipe down a little bit. (laughs) It's so that, that, that I read to pop down a little bit. You know, <laughs> type ones, your core longing, obviously, is to believe that you are good. And so I think that that in context of this conversation today is going to be huge. But it's funny that you mentioned that where you said, I think everybody has a little bit of the inner critic. That is the point of this book by Jeff mm-hmm. and Beth McCord right. and your number, right? Yeah. There is like we each have access to all nine types of of, of personalities, right. but each of us have a a path, and and we we may or may not get to your path today. I really let the Lord lead these conversations, but as a, a but one thing I do want to do, and I've been doing this on every episode, just in case you extrapolate one episode and I begin to use words that people don't understand. So in the book, more than a number, Beth and Jeff McCord uses. Um, these t- these terms that I want to make sure that everybody understands when we use them, what we mean. So misaligned and wounded child, and essentially a misaligned person, regardless of who you are, is not living in the truth or under the authority of the scriptures. We're living in, in ourselves. We're we're just we're acting as literally a wounded child. Like if you can imagine hurting yourself and not having anybody to help you, when we're misaligned and wounded that certain p- things come out in us. And sometimes those things make it difficult to do things like forgive. Now, Amber, one of the things that I've been doing for everybody, and it's hilarious because YouTube um, viewers are going to laugh because when I do what I'm getting ready to do, the the facial expressions on the other side of the camera have been nothing short oh, no. of wonderful. <laughs> and so I'm going to read uh, what Jeff and Beth McCord say is a misaligned type one and Mm -hmm. what an aligned type one is. And so when we are living outside of ourselves as a wounded child, type ones as a rule and misaligned struggle to trust in the sovereignty of God, rigid and procedures and protocol, trying to control all the things, trying to fix all the things. And to your point, the inner critic wins over the still small voice of the Holy Spirit But when you're aligned, which is a much bigger paragraph on my paper, it's good news. When you're aligned, you understand that your inner critic doesn't have power over you. You believe there is no condemnation in Christ and you trust it frees you from having to police. And I'm air quoting when I say that because God is in control. Mm -hmm. That's the aligned one. And Amber, so they use a shepherd's look at Psalm 23 in this book. Mm -hmm. And have you ever read that book? Um, I have no, but my husband has, so I know Mm. quite a bit about it. It's beautiful. It's, it's, I've heard it's fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic, but it is essentially the story of Psalm 23 and the McCord use it a lot when we talk about the wounded child. And we're going to be talking about some hard things here today. And we talk about the wounded child and how we have the opportunity to climb up into the good shepherd's lap in those green pastures as Psalm 23 mm-hmm. tells us besides still waters and we get to just kind of hang out there and I got chills as I'm talking probably because you're my friend but just just thinking about being a type one and by the way you have a wing and and, and we'll be talking about more of that uh throughout the, con- the the conversation of a two I'm a two and uh my Enneagram coach says the two has a close is a close second on the inner critic to the to the type one so you, you get a double dose, both of us do, because mm-hmm. because the, we're wing on the other side, and so I understand that that eternal that 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 internal critic voice for sure. 
And so I, you were one of the first people I thought of when I wanted to pick a type one, because I know that you love Jesus, but I also know that you're not going to keep, you're not, you're, you're going to tell us the truth. There's going to be no Sunday school answers and all the things, right? <laughs> That's right. But, because I, I don't have friends that do that. <laughs> so, um, so the first question that we're asking everybody, because I think this is important as we, as we talk about the, the how we're all navigating forgiveness. What does forgiveness mean to you? You know, when I got that question from you, I had to really think about what, what does it mean to me? Because I think I've had a lot of different definitions throughout my life and thoughts about forgiveness, uh, particularly when I've been in seasons where I'm really struggling to forgive or when I wasn't a believer um, or when I haven't been receiving forgiveness from someone that I wanted. But when I thought about it, I mean, ultimately to me, forgiveness is choosing to walk away from retaliation or vengeance or just doing something to get back at someone, even if that's, you know, the silent treatment, um, when they've wronged me. Right. Wow. Wow. This next question is going to be uh, as difficult for, okay, I, I, it's going to be difficult as your friend, but can you tell me of a time when you had to walk through a period of forgiveness? Yeah. I mean, I can tell you a lot of times and I wish that they were periods of forgiveness that were short, but I feel like I still live in a season of having to forgive sometimes the same offense over and over again. Um, but I don't have a strong relationship with my mom. I do have a strong relationship with my dad, but, um, the particular incident that really came to mind is when I was a senior in high school, I said something that really wounded my mom. And, um, that led to living in the same house, but not exchanging words for almost five months. Oh, and, um, I knew it was really hard then things like, uh, you know, I went, I flew on a plane for the first time and there were no words, but just living in the house with someone right. that is a parent, um, not speaking was so strange, but I can look back now and realize like that really, really put, um, a strain on us forever. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've had to do, I had to work a lot to forgive that season of my life. And I have to say, there've been many times that I feel like I've forgiven and I've taken that back because of another argument. Right. Yeah. There, there, there's, there's so much I want to say, but one of the things that, that has been reoccurring, um, and, and I want that uh, when, when I ask people to t tell me their story is, a couple things. One is that forgiveness is not linear, um, that it is really an ING forgiving one another. Mm -hmm. And particularly, you know, because in my case, one of the, the impotence of this series is I feel like I've done a, I feel like I have effectively kind of forgiven, you know, whatever that, that, that actually means that, you know, biblically, it means obviously not holding the offense against the person, but my mom and John, who, you know, my, who was my ex-husband and my mom, because that's easy because they're not alive anymore. Right. And then as I, be, as I stepped into more health and to more one Psalm 39-ness and, and learning how valuable that I am, I got severely wounded by a family member. And mm -hmm. I was having all of these feelings like acting as a wounded too, um, it just, yeah. was, you know, rejected and, 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 and just just so hurt because my core fear obviously is being unwanted and unloved. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to do a podcast series on this and I'm going to use something that helps me understand right. why I, why this hurts so much. And so I am walking through this period where it literally is an ING every day mm -hmm. as I have to decide today, I'm, I'm also not going to retaliate or I'm not going to hold it against you. Yeah. The other, the other thing that people have said that I think is just so remarkably true is that forgiveness does not equal reconciliation. Right. Right. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I think for a long time, I did equate the two. 
when I was much, much younger that I just thought, you know, well, to forgive it's to be in relationship again. Um, but I realize over time that sometimes reconciliation can't happen because the other person has never admitted any wrongdoing. And so how can there be reconciliation when there's only desire on one person's part? Um, I also have realized that sometimes reconciliation can't happen because it's actually not a healthy way forward. Um, it's not, you, you don't need to be reconciled with someone who is abusive to you. Right. And I'm not talking about myself per se. I'm just saying, Drop it you in know, a cast host mode right there. That's right. Like reconciliation is not always the best way forward for either person. And so, um, I think as I began to realize that you could forgive without being reconciled, there was a little bit of a weight lifted, even though I do believe the heart of God is for reconciliation, but I don't think that it is a 100% must because he is the one who knows the hearts of all people. And so he's the one who knows when that is and is not possible. Right. Um, so, I loved it. Yeah. I loved an interview that you did, and this was recent. So this, this will air in October of 2022 and in um, August of 2022, you had an entire series that everyone should go back and listen to, but a particular episode was with Diane Lambert, who is, we should say Dr. Diane Lambert, who has 50 years of experience and, and counseling and trauma counseling. Trauma. And Amber, when I tell you that episode, when she said, she just kept saying the same thing about trauma survivors. They were my teachers. They were yeah. my teachers. They were it's my incredible. Teachers. And that's why I'm doing this is I'm having people get behind microphones and tell their stories of pain because they are, they, we, you guys are teachers, you're teachers to other people out there who have this loud inner critic in their mind. And a type one, in my opinion, can go one of two ways. But I wanted to go back to the Diane Lambert uh, energy interview for just a second, because as you guys were talking about forgiving the abuse of power in, in the context of the conversation, because that that entire series was really about abuse of power, church hurt, um, cele Christian celebrity. It's right. just it was such an, uh, such a powerful series. But one of the things that you landed on with um with someone who's been doing this for five decades you said to her do you think that when we forgive these people now we're ta not talking about again you or me but when we forgive these people who abuse power and the names are all on the news just a, another one just the, just re a couple of days ago do you think when we forgive them because we are commanded to forgive them we're giving them a gift by taking them out of in this case power but do you think that we're giving them a gift as by taking the opportunity to hurt us again. And so bringing that back down to you and me, am I giving my sister and are you giving your mom a gift by taking the opportunity away for them to hurt us again? I think we might be giving both ourselves gifts, you know? Yeah. I mean, I honestly, like, I can't even, like, I can't take credit for that because it was actually Mary Demuth in a conversation that I had with her a couple, maybe last year, year before last because I asked her, I said, Mary, so we are as Christians, people who are supposed to be forgiving and extend grace. So like, what is the way forward in these situations? Because she works very closely in these situations as well. And what she had said was, we can forgive people, but just because we forgive them does not mean we put them back in a position of power where they can wound again when they are not healthy. And so I brought that to Dr. Diane Langberg and she said, yeah, we're actually doing more damage to them by putting them back in a place where they have not dealt with their issues and their trauma and their abuse of other people. And we're, we're withholding that gift from them to kind of force them into a place of I'm going to take care of myself. And I think that's true. And the reality is sometimes we can be viewed as, well, that's not a gift. You're being um, vengeful. You're not being full of grace. Right. And it comes back down on the one who has been hurt. Yep. And that's just heartbreaking because 
we all have to be held accountable. And I do not think there's anything wrong with saying, no, you can be forgiven, but that doesn't mean again, in my situation that you get to continue parenting me in such a way that is borderline abusive. Talk of, no, it is abusive. Yeah. Toxic and all the things. Yeah. And so that I wanted to bring it back around to that, to my listeners who, as you know, are primarily trauma survivors. And I cannot tell you how many times I've heard, I can't forgive because you don't know X mm-hmm. and, or fill in the blank. And, and, and guys, you're so right. I don't know X. There are, there are stories that come to me and my jaw drops. I'm like, I have no idea how this person is living on this planet fully knowing that 90% of the people that know my story are like, um, how are you living on this planet? Mm -hmm. And that just goes to show that God gives grace for the things that we are to go through. But that being said, if you are a trauma survivor, and most of my listeners are, we are not in any way advocating that just because you are commanded to forgive, that you go back and that you put yourself under that 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 constant ability for them to hurt you again and it doesn't matter whether it's physical abuse whether it's verbal abuse whether it's just a toxic relationship so there's there there are reasons season lifetime people in your life and so forgiving does not mean and i particularly felt feel very convicted right now to speak to my to my domestic violence survivors mm-hmm. forgiving does not mean go back no. right it, it, forgiving does not mean go back. And so, so I, I'm really letting the Lord lead these conversations. We are talking about the Enneagram. We are talking about the Enneagram internal profile, but I, but I'm letting the Lord lead the conversations. But I, one of the things I thought of, you're the very first person I thought of because I knew I wanted you as my one, knowing that you guys could go one of two ways on this forgiveness thing, right? <laughs> like you could be, because you want to be good, you want to be right. Um, not just in your Facebook statuses and your Instagram posts, but no, in your life. life, right? You want life to be in line. I want my one of my very best friends in the world is a type one. She's my general manager, and and everything has to be fair, Amber, to the point where when she buys her 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 kids get uh, pre- uh, Christmas gifts, yes. she has to spend the same amount oh. on all three kids, mm-hmm. right? So ones that's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just uh, it's just a a, a person. The way we are. <laughs> <laughs> you are, it, it, you need it to be right. And so when I was thinking about forgiveness, the other option is you, um, you're pretty angry when things aren't right. Oh yes. Yeah. And so, and so I wonder if in your, in your experience as, as a type one, if you feel like being made that way has made it easier or harder for you to, and, and let's just say in general, like you did this whole series for a reason on your own podcast as you're working through some things. And so which way do you tend to bend? Like, I'm just going to forgive because I want to be, I want to be right. I don't want to be bad. Or I tend to have a more difficult time forgiving because I recognize the injustice in the situation. The second one, I have a much harder time forgiving because I do, I want, I feel like I have a right to hold on to that. Now, that may not be exactly what I'm thinking at the time, but when I've moved through a situation and I've calmed down finally and been and taken a moment to sit down and process and, you know, the incident I was talking about earlier where the time when I was, you know, really called to forgive, it was the first time I went to counseling. And that was one of the things that my counselor had challenged me to do was, you know, make a list in all the ways that you've been wronged. And so I did that in this particular situation. Now make a list of all the ways that you, all the sins that you've been forgiven for um, by Christ. And what she was using was that parable that I don't think that's the one you were referring to earlier, but the one where, you know, that the debt has been forgiven. Yes. And then the debtor gets out of prison and goes out. And when asked to forgive, he says, no way, I'm not doing it. And she was not doing that again to tell me to go back into a difficult situation. But she was just saying, you know, it's so much easier to cling on to the pain sometimes. But we also forget how much we've been forgiven. And that is my constant struggle. 
Yeah. It's really easy for me to look at someone else and be judgmental and critical and see all the ways that you could have done something different. And I can be pretty bold and harsh in coming back with words that can wound. I mean, I am not innocent in situations most of the time. Oh, no. Come on now. I mean, I'm serious. Like, I think we, I think there is a responsibility for all of us to own some of the things that we've done. And again, I'm not talking about domestic abuse. I'm talking about in my situations with arguments with people and things like that. Like, what is it? You know, there's been things about my personality that, yeah, I need someone else to forgive me because I can be very much like, no, it is this way. And if you don't do it this way, then I don't want anything to do with you. Yeah. That's that one coming out. Right. And the, and the, right. The, right. The misaligned wounded child, um, where, where you're rigid, right. Like and harsh uh, critic and like judgmental, like that is strong. So I say that because with forgiveness, um, it's much easier. I am not, I don't, uh, go towards the wing nine as much, which is, okay, I do want to be good and keep the peace. Right. Um, And so I'm just going to be quick to forgive and, you know, put it underneath the table unless somebody else can match my anger. And then if someone comes at me and is just as forceful and it's someone that I actually care about, I'll quiet down pretty quick and start going, okay, wait a minute. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something's, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's really Um, that. Wow. That's that, 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 that's so, well, it's fascinating because it's, it's, it's just, it's beautifully, you beautifully laid it out for us because in the Enneagram internal profile, um, so for one, for example, your, the, the things that you have access to, and you just referenced it to it, like, I don't wean very much into the nine is nine, two, three, four, and six. And so nine, you just mentioned is known as the peacekeepers. Right. And, and not only that, and I've got a very dear friend who is a nine and she, um, I love her to death because, but, and, and, and you also have access to a six, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but my other, one of my closest friends, my friend Chrissy is a six, both of these, um, types that, that, that type ones have access to the, the peacemakers can at, at some point see everybody's perspective. Right. So like you just said, like if it's a relationship that you really care about, it, it, you, you kind of hit the brakes and pause and try to lean into, you know, the healthy attributes of, of the nine that, that is actually listed in, um, in the McCord's book. And I'm just going to read them for you because I think that, um, I think that you, um, that you laid it out beautifully. Um, if I could find it, I would actually read it for you, but I'm sorry, I can't read it for you. So we will cut that editor. Um, but the healthy part of the nine is being able to see, see other people's perspectives. I think that that is so interesting that you pointed that out, that you tend to wing, um, a little bit more into, um, I guess you would wing into the, the other wing would be the two, which is, uh, which I understand quite often. Well, Well, I mean, and I wing it. So I was looking through the book and I, as I was reading through some things, um, one wing to when it comes to the beloved child or just the healthy self, right? What it does say is you maintain boundaries by saying no to helping others when it's not a personal responsibility. And I know that doesn't apply directly to forgiveness, but I do a pretty good job with those kinds of things when it comes to even forgiveness, like, Okay, um, I I may not even get into an area of needing to be forgiven there because I can just kind of set pretty healthy boundaries. But then with this wounded child and a wing nine, this is what it says. (laughs) Stubborn until the other person gives in the correct way of doing things. (laughs) Like, listen, (laughs) I read that and I was like, I mean, I really am a hot mess. because. (laughs) I mean, I can, and it's interesting though, to look back and see the progress I've made, because that's also a huge way that my mom dealt with this situation when I was a senior in high school, right? Right. She did not talk to me for months and we lived in the same house. And when I was either a junior or senior in college, I did that very same thing to my roommate. 
that. Really? And part of that, I mean, I didn't even pay attention at the time to how dysfunctional and wounding that was, but I can look back now and be like, well, you were handling things, the exact same thing, the exact same way that was modeled for you. But also I was living in this wounded child type, like, no, I will not give in until somebody comes to me and gives in first. How did that work out when you got married? Right. Um, well, I remember the very first time that I walked out the door and threw a fit and just like went to a restaurant and didn't answer my phone or anything for hours. And when I got home, Sam said like, you can't, you just can't function that way. I mean, that's just not okay. And so that first couple of years was pretty rough, but he's the person, right? He's right. not quick to verbally explode. He's not one that's just going to let me hide. He's also not going to force himself on me, but he will say something. So he has a place in my life that no one else has ever had. Which is so um, awesome. Yes. Which is trust, um, patience, uh, and you know, that like loving kindness. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, and that's so I've mean. been able to grow because I've been able to be like, okay, this relationship matters to me. Yeah. And, 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 and it, so it drives home that point of that wounded child versus the beloved child, yeah. you know, and, and I understand, I can understand, I have more context for the wounded child because I, yeah. I physically was wounded. But when I think of, again, their reference to Psalm 23, uh, or a shepherd's look at Psalm, Psalm 23, and I look back at my life and the things that I've been through, and I know that I am uh the, he left the 99 to find the one and that i you know so i'm i'm a two you wing two and healthy twos when you we are operating in our belovedness like you said you set boundaries but mm -hmm. but but twos love they're generous and so paired with with that strong one in you i mean it's a superpower in my opinion <laughs> and then and then i heard you talk a little bit about so you also have access to the type 6 which is the loyalist which is i'm going to protect you but i also kind of see all the pitfalls it sounds I like i think it's actually a 7 oh is it 7 i think i yeah i think i have access to 4 and 7 it's it's maybe 7 in unhealth and 4 in health that's right so edit let's hang on editor cut that out sorry I need to start that's okay so, so talk to me a little bit about the seven part. So you have access to seven. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, and for people who may be listening, I think sometimes the Enneagram and you've had people on already who've kind of explained it a bit, but we have access to all nine types, oh yes. but at the same time, we just, and we can see this in our personalities. There's certain traits that come out stronger when you're in a healthy place. There's certain traits that come out more when you're in an unhealthy place and so on and so forth. And so for me as a one, I'm pretty sure I go towards a seven when I'm actually not healthy. I think that's right. Yeah, it is. I, I, I now I'm seeing it where I've written it. Or yes. maybe it's the four, but anyways, <laughs> it says uh, the wounded child of a seven demands that others meet personal needs, criticisms, and desires. Um, my husband would say yes and amen to that. <laughs> so when, you know, because the seven is the happy, you know, my buckets, right. I, I need fun, 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 fun. They're the fun ones, but their buckets never full. Right. I call them the good time Charlies. Yes. Yeah. But, but here's the thing. You have the bucket and the greatest picture I've ever heard is it has holes in the bottom. Yeah, so no yeah. matter how much you fill it up, it's never, ever full. Right. Um. So yeah, there are tons of fun, but it's like, oh my gosh, who can go a hundred miles an hour? Right. Well, so for me, I can totally be that way, but also when I'm exhausted or whatever, I mean, I can just, everybody needs to do what I want to be done right now. You're not doing it good enough. Um, and so I feel like there's a lot of areas where I have to really work towards asking other people to forgive me yeah. for things like that, like criticism and, um, you know, demanding that other people meet all these needs. 
So that's kind of where I think I fall into the seven. You, a little you bit. got me, you got me at a mic drop there for a minute, because that is something that I had not considered on any other interview and, 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 and listeners won't hear on any other interview is, you know, people hit play on this. This will be a very popular series. Uh, one of the most popular episodes that I've had, it was called forgiving trauma makers because mm -hmm. everybody's searching for information on forgiveness. We've read all the books, we've done all the things, but what you just did was brought it full circle back to that mm -hmm. beloved child, putting ourselves under the authority of the scripture and that I have to forgive too. You know, and I have to ask, have to for, ask forgiveness. for forgiveness. Yeah. So not only do I have to forgive, but, but I'm, there are people having conversations on other podcasts about me. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Amen. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 and seriously. So, and so when we're not living aligned with scripture, not living with, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, not living as image bearers, then we are going to be on the other side of this where we have to ask for forgiveness. I think that is such a powerful point that you brought up as you access the 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 really cool thing in the Enneagram internal profiles you have access to to both the or you can exhibit and show up in the world as both the beloved or either the beloved child or the wounded child. And so so this book is amazing, guys, if you get it because you can go and, and and it gives you your own Enneagram profile like mine is one, two, four and eight. And so I'm looking on the right side of the page because on the right side of the page is acting as a beloved child. And so I find out, Oh, I have access to the good parts of, of the beloved parts of the ones I have access to the beloved part of the eights, which right. is, you get the worst rep ever. Right. I have, I, and then, and it helped me realize that when I became a beloved child, that I was able to step into what is also in your, in your Enneagram path, the four, which are these incredible people who feel these big emotions, who have, who have crazy creativity. We're both content creators. We're both podcasters. And so how cool is it that we are not what, you know, and this was the, the McCord's point. If I were walking around going, I'm a two, I'm a two, I'm a two. Right. Then I, I wouldn't be able to recognize that I'm stepping into my belovedness because we both have four in our, or in our Enneagram internal profile uh, path. I can go to that four and I can have big emotions. I can share them. I can listen to them. And then yeah. I can create these stunning works of creativity. And for me, that comes by way of behind the keyboard or behind a microphone. For a lot of people, it's artwork and stuff like that. Right. And so, you know, the whole point of this podcast is, A, we have been forgiven by the star of the story, who is Jesus and uh, you and I, I think, had a, had an exchange at some point, and and I've mentioned this so many times. But if I would, somebody said, "What would, you, where would you go?" And it might have been you. Where would you go if you went to Israel? And my answer was, I would go on that hill where I know that His blood spilled, and the and the earth was changed forever. The literal soil of the earth was changed forever. And so, guys, if you do not know the star of the story, who is Jesus, mm -hmm. who we believe is the reason why we have the ability to forgive and why we are forgiven right in the show notes is going to be contact Amy, contact Amber. Both of us would love to introduce you to the star of the story. Yeah. But the point of this whole series is for you to understand that your forgiveness path may look very different than yeah. somebody else's. You're going to hear nine different answers on when, when I ask somebody what they mean by forgiveness, but we all land at this commandment in Ephesians 4.32 be kind one to another, tenderhearted, uh, compassionate, forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. And then we get to step into the belovedness. This book points out just about every page that if we step into the belovedness, if you just close your eyes for a second and picture Psalm 23, and you picture the good shepherd saying with his arms open wide saying, I left the 99. I've been looking for you. Come to me. And him just taking, and, and that's so true about trauma survivors, is just taking his safe arms around you and you're hearing his heartbeat. You can live in belovedness. Amber, people ask me all the time. I am, I am absolutely nothing without my Jesus, but people who don't know Jesus ask me all the time, Amy, how can you? And they fill in the blank, mostly as stuff like breathe, because the Lord has just redeemed the years the locusts have stolen. And so for those of you out there listening who have experienced trauma that Amber or I could not understand on our best day, know that the star of the story knows and that he loves you. 
and that we're not asking you to do something that you're not ready for, because when you know the star of the story, he is going to give you your own path to forgiveness. We use the Enneagram as a tool because for a lot of people who are really searching, and we all are right now, COVID did a number on all of us. It fundamentally changed a lot of us. It fundamentally changed who we are in some ways. My podcast was started because of the of the pandemic. And so as we are wherever we are on that, um, no doubt family relationships have been strained and so many things have happened because we've all been scared. We've all been acting as the wounded child, um, especially in those early days when we were all locked in our houses and buying all toilet paper. We've all been, <laughs> we've all um, been in a period where we're, we're reacting as the orphan child or as the wounded child. And you don't have to do that anymore today, guys. And so um, Amber, I always love to give the mic to the guest at the very end, uh, especially as it pertains to specifically, even though we've talked about your, the different, uh, your, your different Enneagram uh, internal profile. And again, that book is called More Than Your Number by Beth McCord. Uh, uh, Amber actually will um, provide me her um, affiliate link on Amazon where you can buy that book. And that will too be in the show notes. But Amber, if you were to be behind a, a, a microphone or a podium and somebody asked you, what is the best advice you can give to type ones as it pertains to forgiveness? What do you think you'd say <laughs> to them? That it is a process. Like you said, it is not linear and it's okay to have to revisit things over and over again to work through forgiveness. Jesus consistently and continually forgives us. We have to confess, yes, but hit his grace really is enough. I mean, that sounds so cheesy because that's okay. the name of my show, but I say that because as a one, I know how strong your inner critic can be. And I know how strong of a critic you can be on other people. And so you have to remember that God's sanctification is until the day of Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean you're going to arrive today and that everything is just going to be peachy keen and you don't have to practice over and over again forgiving. So be patient with yourself, be patient with others, and remember that you can ask and receive forgiveness over and over and over again. Love it. And as we do, right, as 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 sons and daughters of the Most High God, yes. we ask for forgiveness over and over. And so that's such a good word to the ones. Guys, we um, are going to continue this. So this is only our first week. In two weeks, we will bring you Lindsay Tozer, who will represent our Enneagram type two. And uh, you might recognize Lindsay as having been on the podcast as uh, she is a trauma. She has PTSD as being um, a, a member of a society that many don't want to be the cause of accidental death and injury. And so Lindsay will be here telling us a little bit more about that story in two weeks. But before I leave this microphone, I don't leave one don't leave a podium. I don't leave a keyboard. So I, I declare this over you, Amber, and I declare it over listeners. You are seen, you are known, you are heard, you are loved, and you're so, so valued. See you guys back here in two weeks. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Amber. <laughs>